Good afternoon. Welcome to Finding Happiness in Hard Times. My name is Ken Burtness, and I'm coming to you from Haleiwa out at the North Shore of Oahu. And today we have a very special program, one that I'm sure that you'll enjoy, called The Joy of Alaska. And my special guest is my cousin, Mary Burtness, who's a teacher and a longtime resident of Alaska. In fact, Mary's been there 41 years, almost as long as I've been in Hawaii. Uh, and she's got lots of pictures to show us and lots of stories. So welcome to the show, Mary. It's just great having you back. That is fun to be back again, Ken. <laughs> the, uh, the thing about, you know, I think a lot of people in the audience don't think of necessarily of Alaska and Hawaii together, but we are what I call sister states. Uh, we have so much in common. Uh, for instance, we're the two only non-contiguous states in America. Uh, we both have a great ancestral heritage here that we call upon. Uh, we're both very interested in uh, helping people uh, and protecting our environment. In Hawaii, we call it the aloha spirit. And in Alaska, they call it the frontier spirit. Uh, there's just so much, uh, especially the beauty, uh, you know, I've been in Hawaii, like I said, a long time, and uh, I spent a lot of time on the islands uh, that, I, that we can go to. And uh, I've seen a lot, but there is so much I haven't seen. And uh, I'm guessing that's the same for you, Mary, because I know that Mary's been at, you know, all over the state. And she's going to take us on a joyride uh, to see all those spots. And I'm really looking forward to it. So, Mary, let me turn things over to you. Well, thank you, Ken. Yeah. Um... You have to think about Alaska, too, being, you know, much larger than Texas, even. So, yes, there's a lot to see. And there's very few, there's very little access. The road system is very small compared to the entire state. So there's lots of traveling around via boat and uh, airplane, small airplanes. So uh, it's it been really wonderful because after I have retired, I've been able to go to some of those farther out places that I had never been to before. So um, just a little bit of background. Um, I landed in Alaska in July of 1982 and um, in Northway, which is uh, 50 miles over the Canadian border. And then I moved to Fairbanks from 1986 to 1989, which is smack dab in the center of the state. And then we moved out to King Salmon, which is at the top of the Alaska Peninsula, that peninsula that goes out into the Aleutian chain. We lived there till 2001. And then we moved back to Fairbanks, and I'm still here. Um, we retired in 2016, and it was time to see more of Alaska. So if you want to show that first picture, I can kind of talk about my journey. This is a picture of me in 1982. This was my Christmas postcard to everyone, but I'm at a roadside and I'm looking over the Tetlin National Wildlife Refuge and way out there is Northway. And I was trying to decide, is this where I can live? Because when I thought I, when I was coming up, I said, oh, I'll live in Anchorage. That, that shouldn't be such a big um, adjustment for me. But I ended up in Northway and I have friends from there from that period of time till today, I was totally immersed in the Athabascan uh, culture. Uh, the town was mostly Athabascan natives, and it was a town of 150 people, and I taught preschool and um, uh, speech therapy. So that was my first spot that I was at. So we might go to the next slide. And this is where I live today. <laughs> We have a little house, not not but five miles from Fairbanks. This is our front yard, and we like to feed the animals. And once in a great while, we have these great big moose come in and decide that they're going to eat the bird food. Um, we love Fairbanks. It's a uh, university town. It also has a couple of um, Army bases here, Army and Air Force Base. So it's, it's kind of a hub. So it has lots of... Um, opportunities for culture and and shopping, shopping for your needs and things. So, and then uh, uh, we spend a lot of time camping 
and hiking and canoeing. And this picture happens to be in Tangle Lakes. It's about mm, 200 miles south of here in a series of lakes. And that's kind of the vegetation you see. And this was in June. We got snowed on on that trip, but we spent a lot of time um, camping. So it's a kind of a scenery of that one of our trips in the in the middle of the state. Snowed in, in, in June. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, you could expect it. And I had a friend who who was so excited because he's it's never snowed on his birthday before, and it was August twenty third, I think. So <laughs> yeah, we we can have snow. It didn't stick around, but we have snow probably in the interior. You know, um, probably the end of September all the way through April. And I think what people don't, when they think of Alaska, they they don't realize that we have so many different um, climates. I mean, the southeast, they rarely get snow and it's rainy. And the way north, it's always snowy. So uh, it's very, very different. So it's very interesting. The one thing that I really liked about being in the interior, uh, and I was uh, stationed uh, at a small mountain uh, just north of uh, Fairbanks. And the one thing I loved about the climate change was that the fact that the cold was very cold, but it was a dry cold. And I don't do too well with wind chill, <clears throat> but in Fairbanks or above Fairbanks, uh, even though the year I was there, it got to 59 below zero, uh, you were comfortable. And uh, they told me when I went in that that was dangerous because you could stand outside and uh, you could feel fairly comfortable and you could just sort of go to sleep in 15 minutes and die because it was so cold. <laughs> so I made sure that uh, I had at least six layers of clothes on me when I went outside, but I love the uh, the dry cold, but that was terrific. Yeah, it, it is really pleasant. We lived out in Bristol Bay in the Aleutians and it was very windy there and I was more uncomfortable and cold in that climate than I ever was in the interior. And a story I learned in, uh, um, a tip I learned in Northway was I always walked to school. You know, I did, I, we rarely started our vehicles because it was, it was really a cold spot. It was a sink. And I always knew it was 40 below or colder because when I blinked my eyes, they would freeze shut. And I'd have <laughs> to hold them really, really, really tight to melt them and then open them wide and hold them as wide as I could for as long as I could. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. My temperature gauge, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So if you want to go to the next slide, I can continue. Uh, we're only about 90 miles north of uh, Denali National Park. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of Denali. And we can actually see Denali in Fairbanks. Um, uh, many, many days. But here we were, we were able to drive into the state and a lot of people come to see the mountain but only 30 percent of the people you'll have a 30 percent chance of seeing the mountain on any given day and this is what we got to see it one day and uh it was a lottery day where we could drive in and ken you you got to take one of those trips with us yeah for sure and it was just incredible i also yeah. took a trip down there in 67 when i was there and uh we could in 67 we could get a lot closer so um, and I did have one day that I could see the top. Uh, Denali is so high. It, it used to be, of course, Mount McKinley, but uh, Denali is a much better name for it. Um, and uh, it's so high that it always has a, a cloud cap on it. And, uh, you know, and it, but those few days when it's open, it's spectacular. It's just amazing. And and as a local, you always want to be, as you're heading to Anchorage, you want to be on the right-hand side of the plane because they fly by it. Oh. So if no one else on the, on the ground can see it, you can see it in the air. And likewise, when you travel back up, you want to be on the left-hand side to see it. And oh. it's you never get tired of it. Never get tired of it. Yeah. So I'm sure there's places in Hawaii, too, that are like that. Well, I drive out to Mount Kaala, uh, you know, when, I, when I'm coming from North Shore to the South Shore, I go Central, and I'm always headed straight toward Mount Kaala, and most of the days that's got a cloud cap on it, too, and it's only less, a little less than 4,000 feet, so uh, we get lots of clouds, <laughs> and uh, as you do, too, so 
I sort of think of uh, Denali when I when I see Mount Kaala with its uh, cloud cap and think, yeah, okay. <laughs> Something you always want to get a glimpse of. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll go on to the next slide. Um, subsistence is uh, very important to Alaskans. We do a lot of fishing and hunting and berry picking and gathering of uh, vegetation and stuff. And this is a picture of my daughter, Katie, and we're on the Copper River. And um, the Copper River is, oh, I think it's I think it's like an eight mile, eight hour trip from Fairbanks and you go down and you have this huge net, which is probably about uh, two and a half feet circumference. And you dip it into that water when you can't see a thing and you wait for it to bump and you pull up a fish. And she had pulled up this fish. And if you can see, she has a, a life vest on and she's also tied off with a rope. Because if you fall in this river, as you can see, it's pretty rapid. You would be gone in a second. You, you, there, you, there's no survival. So this is kind of a, a challenging fishery. But we usually <laughs> we usually get twenty to thirty fish a year. We and um, very much instilled that lifestyle with our with our children who both moved back here. But that's a picture of Katie with a Chinook salmon. So. Yeah. And then uh, again, subsistence is really important. And here we are down by Ketchikan on Prince of Wales Island. And there is halibut and uh, coho and cod there. Uh, friends of ours took us out fishing. And, and that was really wonderful because that's way down on the panhandle. Um, it's the last city or the last year, city in, um, I wouldn't even call it a city, town in Alaska as you're heading to Seattle on the panhandle. Um, beautiful, beautiful. We hit a lot of blue days. It's usually pretty gray and rainy though. I think, mm, I'm thinking they get like 60 inches of rain a year. So it's a pretty rainy area. The Southeast is very different. Um, different native groups, different history, different uh, lifestyles, uh, very, very different than the rest of the state. So. And yeah. the capital's down there too, right? Juno, yes, Juno is. Yeah, yeah. Is that, uh, that always seems strange to me with Juno being the capital being so far away from most of Alaska. Is that uh, how did that? Uh, well, any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I think that's where the Russians were in it's Sitka, and mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of the central part of the state at the very beginning. There was mostly commerce. It was an easy place to get from, from Seattle. And so I think that's where it ended up being established. That's where the first territorial governors were. And uh, and then Anchorage kind of came about later. Um, so I think the population was down there to begin with. And then everything started moving more north, especially because of the gold and, you know, the military, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah, and they have tried so many times to move it, and it just it just never did. And now that we have such good communication, there's no attempt at all to move it anymore. Well, politics is very slow moving wherever you're at. <laughs> so that certainly makes a lot of sense to me. So, yeah. Well, and when I first moved here, we were we Alaska was in four time zones. Juno was was four hours different from way over in Nome at the other end of the state. Wow. Uh, yeah, and then they changed it shortly after I moved here in the 80s because, because of our sunlight, because it's so dark in the winter and so light in the summer, daylight savings time, one place to the next, it didn't matter. So we're all one time zone now. Oh, and, wow. it, and it made it really hard for politics and business. So that's why they, that's part of the reason they changed it. Yeah. Well, that so, makes sense. Yeah. Those are two areas that drive everything that we, we have, basically, the politics and the business. Yes, that's for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the next slide is another picture of the panhandle. This is at the very top in Haines and our daughter Frana lived there for a while and uh we went down to visit her several times and we're out kayaking out on the uh I think it's a Chilcat 
bay. So, and the mountains are all around. And this is that that skyline, that dark gray is much more characteristic of the panhandle. But uh, the, uh, people um, living on the coast have a very different type of subsistence lifestyle and much more tuned into tides. So, yeah. and when we were in... Uh, in uh, Bristol Bay, and I don't have any pictures of Bristol Bay and King Salmon, we used to uh, subsistence fish too with a net. You stick out a net in low tide, and then the tide would come in and it would get socked with fish, and then the tide would go out and then you'd have your fish. So, very different. That's one thing I've always admired about you and Jeff and your family is that uh, when you go out, whether you're fishing or hunting, it's all subsistence. There's There's no hunting just for the sport it's hunting for to eat and you eat everything that you 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 know that comes back with you and uh that's always uh you know i think that's just great you know it just it never made any sense to me to hunt just for the joy of uh you know of eliminating fish or animals or whatever so and just... and you share when you get a moose you share it you know because it's you you know it's you get a lot of fish you share it yeah that's part of it too so okay next slide oh and this is uh now we're going to kind of go around the state and up to the top but this is um we were fortunate enough to be a friend of ours has a small plane and and you, you travel a lot around in small plane in in the state and this just happens to be in a march it was in march beautiful spring weather and we're flying out of Valdez and this is the Chugach range which is not too far from Anchorage and it we flew all the way over to Columbia Glacier but it, it's pretty spectacular to be uh, flying on the, the mountaintops and seeing this is all glaciers up here this is an ice field so uh, we felt very fortunate to have such a gorgeous day that day. What's, what's an ice field like? I mean it's it makes me think of a skating rink, but I'm sure that's ah. not the case. <laughs> An ice field just means it's it's total glaciers. And so then the fingers of the glaciers are going down between the um the mountains. So the Columbia Glacier comes off an ice field. So really it's just a huge plate of ice that's thousands and thousands of years old. But you're not li likely, if you're on top of it, you're not likely to break through and drown in the, uh, I mean, you know, like the pictures we see in the movies, you know, if you're somebody skating on the ice and the, the ice breaks and they fall down and die. They, they, this, they, I assume that this, this ice is pretty thick and pretty strong. Well, this ice is made from compaction of snow. It has nothing to do with water. It's mountaintops underneath. So it's just compacted snow, you know, it just weight of the snow turns it into an ice field ah. which is the glacier sure you'd land on top of a mountain then exactly <laughs> <laughs> yes all right I so. learned something today thanks <laughs> there you go okay and the next stop is this is in um prince william sound this is uh uh, southwest, south, southeast of Anchorage. It's one of the most beautiful sounds that I've ever been in. It's huge. This is where um, the uh, oil spill was so long, long ago outside Valdez. And um, all this area was very much impacted by that oil spill. But this is the town of Cordova. And we've been there a couple times visiting friends, fishing. It's, it's a gorgeous area. Rode a ferry over to this one. So it, it's pretty well recovered from the uh, the oil spill. Yes, yeah, it's it's pretty. You know, people can still see some evidence. All the fish and the animals are back. Yes, oh. it was. It, the economic part is just about there. They've they've uh, Exxon Valdez has uh, pushed all the giving out of money for so long that many of the people have passed away. That should be getting it so it, it's still in the courts but yes it was quite an impact so and the next slide see we're getting down in time this is the matanuska glacier and just to show you 
that that glacier should have been as where I was taking the picture. It's just slowly receding. And this one, we were able to walk all the way up to the toe of it. And glaciers just are amazing. And this glacier does go up to that same ice field that I was flying above, several hundred miles away. But it's the same ice field. And the next picture slide. Now we're down in the Aleutian chain. We had the uh, a good fortune to fly down to Dutch Harbor, which is halfway down the Aleutian chain. And the Aleutian chain is long. I think it's a couple thousand miles long and almost goes to Japan. And we're on the ferry and we had beautiful skies. And this is a tiny little village in the Aleutian chain called Chignik. And the Aleutians are all... Um, uh, volcanic. So a lot of them are pretty uh, cone-like or that, like this one obviously had blown at some point in time. But it, it was a beautiful trip. And the next slide. Now we're way up in uh, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And um, a friend of ours who guided up there forever now only goes up there once a year. And he takes a bunch of friends and you land in the middle of nowhere. It was probably like an hour small plane, six seater plane to um, Arctic Village. And then another small bush pilot came and picked us up. And we flew another hour and a half up into the Brooks Range. And we spent 10 days here just hiking around. And we saw quite a, quite a few caribou, but it's very, you know, very little vegetation, lots of mountains that have no vegetation, just straight rock and the next picture well before you go with the oh. antlers tell us about the i love the picture of the antlers in front of that yeah uh, uh, th those are caribou i assume huh yes caribou uh, both the male and female have antlers and they drop them every year so you see antlers all over the the uh, tundra wow so yeah so Great it's picture. pretty cool thank you and the next one, this is actually the Hall Road. Um, and if you could see way off in the distance, that's the infamous pipeline. And um, and over that hill, it goes into the Arctic Slope, which is like 100 miles. And then you hit the Arctic Ocean and it's uh, Prudhoe Bay. The oil fields are up there. But again, this is the Brooks Range, so there's no trees and just tundra and a lot of bare rock. But it, this is in July, so there was no no sunsets here. It was just sun all the time. So it was spectacular. It's hard to imagine, you know, with, with how beautiful a place can be without trees, because I love trees. They're one of my passions. But uh, the Brooks Range was always very ethereal, you know, the pictures I saw, but I always wanted to go up there and never had a chance. So I'm looking to my next lifetime to uh, spend some more time in Alaska and, and see the Brooks Range because it was incredible, I thought. It's very exciting. It's very fun to hike around there because you never get lost because <laughs> you can always see everywhere and you can see the bears from far away. So, you know, know to be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> How do you prepare for bears? Well, you get your bear spray out. <laughs> you If you're with a group of people, you get together so you look like you're a large group of people or you try to go in the diff an opposite direction. So. <laughs> Terrific. In the last slide was my most recent trip, which was pretty exciting. It's out. It was out in Kotzebue, a small Inupiaq village in, of Kotzebue, and we were out she fishing. And uh, this is actually the Kotzebue Sound, which is right on the Bering Sea. And this is in May, and you can actually be running snow machines all over the place. And we got about 115 pounds of she fish. People were out subsistence fishing. So I'd never done anything like that before, but it was just amazing to have such expanse, flat expanse of snow. And it, it was pretty warm. I mean, you had to have gear on, but it was mostly for the speed of the snow machines. So that's, you know, that's my was, Alaska. Uh, all right. Well, when I was in the Air Force, uh, you know, I was a, a weapon controller, which meant I worked with planes, and we flew them all over the uh, the state, including out to the Bering Sea. And uh, I was going to ask you, because that, that's the reason we were out, we were sending our aircraft over to the Bering Sea, was to watch the Russians. And the Russians were on the other side watching us. 
And sometimes we went a little bit over there and sometimes they went a little bit over here. And uh, luckily it was the 60s and uh, we were on friendly terms with them. We, nobody was shooting at anything. We were just taking pictures of each other. But I was wondering on that uh, that last slide, can you see the Bering Sea from Kotzebue? I mean, the uh, the Russian side of the Bering Sea? No. No, because it would it would just be a uh, diomede, the two diomedes that you would actually see Russia, and that's a little farther north. You know, we're pretty far from Kotzebue. It's uh, it's maybe about it's about I think it's uh, about twenty miles or so over the Arctic the Arctic Circle, but then and then there's probably another hundred miles to the the ocean, and then. Farther up is where uh, Russia is closer. Yeah. It's a little so farther if, northwest. If you, want, if you want to go there and wave at the Russians, you have to go much further than north than Kazakhstan. You do. <laughs> you do. Yeah. Well, Mary, we're we're running short of time, and I, my last question for you was a real quickie. Uh, you've seen so much, but uh, if you're like me, uh, you want to see more of the, you know your state that you love. Uh, if you're going to take when when is your next trip? Uh, into places in Alaska that uh, you haven't been before? And uh, can you describe what, what's on your wish list for those new places that you haven't seen yet? I'd love to go to Nome, which is a little farther south than Utiavik because there's a lot of good birding there. I've never been to Utiavik, which is whole name used to be Barrow, Paktovik. Those are all way up on the north, you know. Uh -huh. There's the Kobuk Valley, which wasn't too far from Kotzebue that I never knew about. I'd love to go there. I wouldn't mind going back down to the Aleutians. Oh, my goodness. There's too many places, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mary, we're just about out of time. So I just want to thank you so much for bringing your pictures and your stories and yourself to tell us a little bit about Alaska, a place that I really love as well. And uh, I just thank you for sharing all that. Much wow, well, thanks for bringing me on. I sure enjoyed doing these encounters with you. <laughs> and I want to thank uh, everybody at uh, Think Tech Hawaii, of course. I want to thank Michael and Jay and Haley and Carol and everybody. And most of all, I'd like to uh, thank the people who are listening in and uh, are watching this. And I hope that you really enjoy this because I certainly did. Uh, my next show is going to be in 2024. Uh, the first week of uh, of January, we'll, I'll be on and back again to talk about finding more happiness in the times that, well, finding more happiness in 2024. So I hope to see you then. Aloha. <laughs>